the, the, the escalating thing that can happen with tribalism and it goes here and then they said this and that we hit them more and we hit them more and now they're showing these pictures of these dead kids and this one before you know it like there's just kind of mania going on just confirm confirm they'll sit around for three hours at a dinner just talking about how right they are the entire dinner and everyone of course agrees because if you don't agree you're an awful person you're not in the group I think there's people in America right now, lots who would cheer if I, you know, I was murdered for being Jewish tomorrow. They would, they would say, this is, that's part of the struggle that needs to happen. You know, but if I met them and knew them in a different context, I would think, oh, lovely person. And they would think about me. Yeah, I love that guy. Great guy. You know, Independence Day, the thing that brings us all together is a new external villain, yes. but it's another other. We're very online creatures. We're both writers. Like we're online. I don't know how the average person is going to make it <laughs> in this information environment. Tim Urban, welcome to the Pirate Wires pod. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Uh, so Tim is, I mean, Tim, man, you are one of my favorite writers. You're one of my favorite internet personalities. You've written a book just recently, which is what we're going to talk about today, called What's Our Problem? A Self-Help Book for Societies. And I think right off the bat, and this is going to be kind of maybe this is going to be a different sort of podcast for us. It's not just the news. I do want to talk about your book. I want to talk about some of the frameworks that you've laid down for sort of diagnosing a, a lot of the problems we're experiencing in the world right now. I think probably the high level problem, and you can correct me if I'm wrong in a second, is just this like relentless polarization that makes it impossible for us to come together and think kind of freely in, in, in any way. Um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the framework. We're going to apply it to some stuff today. And um, I think first, just when I I started reading the book, it like is a, there are a couple things about you as a writer that I really like, and one is just your fun kind of not even fun. There there's a really you have a really smart approach to infographics. Um, you do this thing on like page one or two where you lay out all of human history on on a on. On like little squares, it's like each square I think is is two hundred and uh, two hundred fifty. Uh, what was it? Years. Years. So Years. It's, it's a thousand page book. Yeah. So you you when you see that when you lay out all of human history in two hundred and fifty year increments, the the sort of most of that, like the massive amount of that, is just hunter gatherer, no recorded history. We're living in this very narrow band. You do this other thing, which is not infographic, but you introduce the idea of technology as this, um, and I agree with you. This is something that I've, I've kind of struggled with throughout my 30s and have kind of come to this conclusion with the help of Marshall McLuhan. Technology is good and bad. Uh, it's it's sort of, it's it's really neither. It's just a way that we do more with less. And there are, you know, there are good things about it and bad things, but the more technology we have, the sort of crazier things can become. And when you see history in that narrow, narrow band, when you see like all of the things that have happened, um, you know, just the, the the last few pages of 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 history, let's say, we're talking from like Jesus Christ to present day. That's nothing. That's snap of a finger. Um, technology, the accelerating power of technology has put us in a situation where the world might look so radically different in just 25 or 30 years that it, it's like inconceivable to us today. And with that comes problems. Um, it, it comes many benefits. We, I talk about them at PyroWires all the time, the benefits, but there are also s significant problems. And when it comes to information technology in particular, it's like one of the very new problems we're dealing with is, uh, is I think, communication, social media, and and what that means for us. Um, maybe right off of the bat, uh, if you want to just maybe lay down the premise for your for your book, I've been talking about it for a second here. I want you to kind of just like come in, tell tell uh, the audience, you know, what it was you were trying to accomplish here. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I, I like to write about, you know, the future and future technology and, um just like kind of imagining what uh what 2050 and 2100 are going to be like and uh, there's so many crazy exciting things and some of them are scary and some of them are really you know um exhilarating to think about and then i meanwhile looked around me in the society and i was like i don't think we're gonna like get there if we don't like n none of that matters if we if like the that the societal house we're living in is like the support beams are starting to re weaken and crumble like 
It's like, it's like, it's like, this is the house that we will need to carry with us into this future. And if the house is not, it's like, this needs to come first. We need to figure. So to me, I was like, what, what is, you know, we have more knowledge than we ever did before. We have more, you know, technology, more prosperity than we ever did before by most metrics. Um, why are we kind of descending into so many of these things that, you know, these, um, you know, I would read about McCarthyism and I'd say, wow, that was so recent. You know, you read about, you know, you read about World War II, the Holocaust. You're like, this was so recent. How could people but behave this way? How could, you know, people like, you know, uh, and you know, more and more we're seeing, oh, okay, that's how people behave that way because we're doing it. We're doing, we're doing little traces of this thing and that thing. And you know, um, you go back to like the you know Salem witch burnings and the witch hunts, and you're like, I, you know, I maybe we're not we're not burning witches, but I'm like, I get it now. I see how a bunch of people no worse than you or you or me could uh, do really bad things. You can just see it, and and it comes with come with this collective madness that happens. So basically, I, I and 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 you know the, the the and of course there's just also the crazy, like you said, political polarization. The fact that. You know, there's there's such collective wisdom that we can have. You know, we can we can understand the nature of, you know, we can understand um, the nature of space time. And, and I want to just stop yeah. you right there because yeah. that part, wisdom, and so you you mentioned that like a handful of times throughout the book, and I think it's such an interesting word that we don't use almost ever in society anymore. It almost sounds like mystical or something and people just, people just don't use that word. But I agree that that once you said it, I thought, wow, that is truly what we are missing right now. You can feel that. It yes. is just, there's a, like a, a broad lack of wisdom. Yes. Um, so it's like, uh, w- which is maybe like a transcendent thing beyond even what is objectively true and not true. Like you can build a weapon of mass destruction through empiricism, but like wisdom is is like what is the utility of it's that? Different than intelligence, yeah. And it's like w- wisdom is you know is is under for example, it's like understanding long term consequences of things that happen, understanding patterns, understanding like you know when I talk about you know if you have a, an individual and they're wise, maybe they have you know an understanding of what makes a good marriage or what makes a good life or whatever. Um, but uh, you know when you talk about the collective, it's like it's. The, the, a wise society, rem, you know, really knows their history. They remember it. They know the patterns. They can see them coming. They under, because of that, they ha, can understand the consequences of certain policies, certain rhetorics, certain kind of arrangements of discourse in a way that people before them didn't. But they have the benefit of, of the hindsight. So they have wisdom. And what it feels like today is you still have lots of individuals, many, I, many that I follow on Twitter, who seem to fully still grasp wisdom you know the the modern um uh you know the 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 lessons that we've all learned and and then yet there's this there's this kind of uh, other strain that is deeply unwise like like falling into every single trap like just making every amateur error and that force kind of has this kind of like it almost like it has this it's like a, it's like a living thing and it's like growing and it's spreading I think what'll be helpful is to get into some examples right now before we get into your framework for thinking through a lot of the problems we're facing. And before we even get into examples, I, I started something earlier that I didn't fully finish, which is your style as a writer. And it, it, I think it is linked to this wisdom thing. I feel when I'm reading your work as if I have like a very thoughtful friend sitting next to me trying his absolute best to see it from all sides to be empathetic and to kind of like step outside of himself. And I, I can just, I can just feel that in you, that like intense desire to be fair. Uh, and you're, I will just say like much more fair than I am. I am like more of a, I would say like wartime writer to a certain extent. I am like, I find an idea. I murder the idea. I saw myself in some of the, in some of the, I think you like diagnosed me as, uh, we'll get into that later of, of like where I would p- perhaps fall into some of these. By the way, I'm not sure about that. I I mean, maybe it's because I happen to agree with you on 99% of the things. So I, but I, I, you are, you're definitely, you have a lot of sass for sure. Um, yeah. And like you're, 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 you know, um, but uh but you, um, I, I, I don't think you're, um, like, uh, small minded or, or like unfair about what you say. I think most of what you say well, is like spot on. So I give yourself, well, thank a- you. 
Yeah. Um, but I will say just like you, you, what you established with me was a certain level of trust. And a, a big part of that was kind of taking it from multiple angles. And so maybe it, it, before we get into your framework, what I would love is just a couple of examples. Like what are some examples of maybe just the problems before we, I don't want golems or, uh, or genies yet. We'll get into those in a second, the latter, none of that, but just like some high level problems that we are facing as a society, um, that we want to overcome in order to, you know, build a better world. So, I mean, the, you know, this is so, so, so we have this capacity for both collective wisdom, but also just collective intelligence. Again, we can, we can discover the, we can discover the, the subatomic particles, right? No human can do that. But collectively, we're, we're, we're like a, it's like there's a species that is way smarter than humans. That is our collective brain. And it can do stuff that none of us can begin to do. Um, and so this is part of why humans are amazing. Um, and we can call up stuff like human rights and call up stuff like, you know, just, just the concepts of fairness and, and ethics and stuff that no other animal is beginning to do, right? On the other hand, we have this crazy capacity to, for collective madness, like just stupidity, evil, um, just, just, you know, psychopathy, basically just like, just like collective everything bad and we can, we are both this is what you know and, and and you know it kind of makes sense to think about you know we evolved to be a successful tribe a long time ago and that tribe had to both be able to solve problems and cooperate in in really you know, useful ways and then it also needed to turn into a, a giant you know a, a group psychopath and murder other people because the ones who weren't like that they didn't stick around we were the well, it was existential right and I, I think one thing you do a really good job of is you explain i mean it, that is a problem that is baked into us at probably some kind of genetic level that we don't even understand. But in the context of a technologically advanced world, it's no longer just a small, the problem of a tribe or two. It's the problem of, you know, the fate of humanity. What happens when that collective madness that we know we are capable of, we just saw, I mean, COVID was a collect, you, I think you named, you, you talked about, you did, you talked about COVID in the book, like that was a collective madness. There were moments of that in different ways that were, you were experiencing a, a collective madness. You, you have all sorts of examples from the GOP and from the social justice movements where like through history, we've seen recent collective madnesses uh, now in the Middle East. Uh, it's like very clear that we are so, in the middle of a right. collective madness and it's it's polarized. Like you see oh, yeah. two collective madnesses. I mean, I'm maybe a little more consistent. Like I... I I don't know that I've been expressing everything on this because I don't know. I don't really want to be getting into Middle Eastern politics. I know. I know. Um, but my group chats are like wild. And I am sort of, I find myself stepping back and being like, wait a minute, am I the moderate here? This is crazy. Uh, yeah. I, when you have the technology to annihilate an entire people, um, the stakes are just higher. So yeah. I, I would say that's like maybe the high level. It's like that atom bomb drop is what I am worrying about. Yeah, no, it's it's like you see, um, you're seeing people, you know, like I'm a Jew and I'm seeing people march in the streets who would cheer if someone murdered me today, right? Yes. And, and and yet, and yet, if I met that person, that uh, someone who would cheer for that in a different context, and they went and met my, I have a baby, and they went and they came over and uh, we hosted them, and they and and then we went to their house, we would love each other and think, oh, what a great person, and they'd be they'd be incredibly empathetic lovely person that that's the crazy this is like this we have this weird switch in our head to turn into complete maniacs and right. i would say unless you're in unless you're in unless you're in israel then i think they don't care there's no way that you're going to meet and they're going to be I nice i still think like that even the craziest people there if you get them in a different totally different context um you know okay of course you know maybe you have some people you know who are who are like they, they, there, there's you know if you are a jew or whatever like you you like they like you're just the, the devil but like it's just in america all the 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 you know march is happening and it's uh i think there's people in america right now lots who would cheer if i you know i was murdered for being jewish tomorrow they would they would say this is that's part of the struggle that needs to happen you know you were a and, colonizer and, and, and if i but if i met them and knew them in a different context i would think oh lovely person and they would think about me yeah i love that yeah, guy, yeah, great guy. That's no. true. and and this is that's weird like we have um yeah and 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 but the the negative side it almost always happens as a collective you know it's not just you know you have a crazy ran, you know ranting person on a street corner but usually it's that um kind of crazy psychopathy happens in this big collective and it like spreads like wolf pheromones people can and something like twitter is as much as i think it's an incredibly positive thing in many ways right now for in a time like this it's also 
you know, social media, um, it's like spreads psychopathy uh, and it comes in at like pheromones and it like sw- switches something in people's heads that just turn them into legitimate psychopaths. It activates that survival instinct. Like yeah. I, when you, I feel it myself right now, I feel this pull. When th- those, what you're talking about, those prote- those those protests, the rape yeah. parades is what I've, uh, so like I, in the early days, especially, I, th- I think Saturday, it was like very, very, very clear what those parades were, uh, what those celebrations were. And I look at that and I feel like I don't want that in my country. Like I feel like unsafe for my loved ones if that is what we are becoming. And um, and that, once that gets in your head, that like, oh my, like I, I literally, that all Saturday and Sunday, I was thinking about my sister and her kids. And like that's that becomes very, very, very hard to remain rational at a moment like that. Once, like once that kind of worms in, and you see people going off on Twitter, it is very like, yeah, collective madness status begins. Even and now, it, and, not- and, and it escalates. So it's like, what happens is you have these. So you know, um, the, uh, I um, read a book recently by Tobias Rhodes Stockwell, our outrage machine, and basically he talks about how we think of empathy as purely a good thing, right? Empathy makes you, um, you know, feel um, um, for others and makes you feel love for them and whatever. And actually empathy, while it can be great, is the, is, is the lever that pulls the psychopathy switch. It is when you're going to see dead children on whatever side that you feel like you're on, that's going to suddenly, you're going to start to feel like kill them all, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, for cra- craziness, right? And so what happens is, if you look at, you know, I actually, you know, I wrote a senior thesis in college about Al Jazeera TV. This is back in like 2004. But, you know, what I noticed there is like, in order to kind of, in order to deflect um, uh, criticism of themselves, like the leaders in these these dictators in the Middle East or whatever, a lot of them would, um, you know, it, it was such like an obvious tactic to just broadcast like dead Palestinians, like whatever. Because it just creates this, it just is, it's just this, it deflects all of this anger that they have. And so it's like, um, the, the, the amount of, um, of this that is generated by kind of propaganda and PR and, and granted there are actual people dying that like, are, but, but like specifically kind of showing certain things over and over it, it it's, it triggers certain psychology. I want to introduce two concepts, um, from your book and then disagree with you a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, or maybe, maybe not. I, I might've just misread this stuff, but um, let's start. So there's there's the concept of the ladder and then there is something a little bit later, which is like sort of optimal states or not optimal states. I would say like um, uh, final states or something of different kinds of thinking. One leads to the genie and one leads to the golem. Uh, and I think that the genie golem thing was really interesting. It's like a kind of very... Uh, colorful and evocative way of talking about some of these ideas as they come alive and sort of dominate us online. But I want to start with the the high level one, the ladder of thinking. Can you just break that down? How people think about ideas on this yeah. left or wrong I ladder? Mean, basically, we have like the what you think axis, right? And that's, you know, in politics, there's far left and left and center and right and far right, right? And that's this horizontal axis. We also could lay it out like what people think about any policy. And you have one extreme here and the other extreme in the moderate. And these all these horizontal what you think axes, axes. And it just felt like we badly needed a how you think axis, um, where at the top, you know, uh, the, and I call it a ladder and at the, at the, you can overlay on any, what you think axis. And at the top, you're, you're, you're just, you're deep down, deep down. True motivation is, is truth. You're just trying to figure out what's right. Uh, and as you creep down, you start to have a rooting interest for a certain position. Um, and you want to kind of be right more than get it right. And as you get to the bottom, you become like a full fledged zealot who there's no there's no amount of evidence that could ever change your mind um because all you are you you now basically are a faithful disciple of a certain idea you you don't you're not the boss in your own head anymore you you live to serve that idea and to protect it you you will you will not let it info you won't ever believe info that can you know contradicts it and you will seek out you know cherry pick info that does and as, as it's not that you're this, oh yeah, I'm stubborn, awesome thinker. You know, I don't, I don't change my mind. It's that you are, you've given up the reins in your head. You're not the boss in your own head. If you're at the top, humbly searching for truth and inevitably saying, I don't know about all kinds of stuff because who couldn't know about everything? 
you're actually, you know, you seem humble, but you're also the, you're kind of like, you know, you're the, you're the alpha dog in your own head. And you're saying, yeah, none of these ideas yeah, are, are, have a permanent residence here. If, if something proves it wrong, it's out and uh, you'll change your mind about anything. So it's a spectrum, right? It's hard to be at the very, very top, especially about pol- political things and things that, um, but, but along that spectrum, yeah, you, but yeah, the very top of it, you have the scientist. Yeah, then yeah you have, and, and I, by the way, and I don't mean career scientists, as we learned during right. COVID and play. Plenty of career scientists are way down down that ladder about their scientific ideas. It's the but scientific method. It's the scientific method, right? It's a scientific way of thinking where you're just like hypothesis and then look for evidence. And then if it's true, it's true. And if it's not, it's not. And if something disproves it, it's out. Um, and then what happens is certain topics like politics, religion, certain things you know, our lifestyle, you know, nutrition, you know, you know, uh, how you raise your kids. There's certain topics that really, they bring our, our, our identity starts being attached to our ideas. And when your identity is attached to your ideas, changing those ideas is not just, oh, I'm going to kick this idea out of my head because it's wrong. I'm going to be a little smarter. No, it's that I have a, an identity crisis here. It actually, an actual fight or flight part of your brain literally lights up and fMRIs when those ideas are challenged because it's like you feel like it's a personal like dangerous attack almost because it's an attack on your identity. And so when that happens, we sink down on the ladder and there's nothing that can change our minds. So this is like an individual, this is how I think about individual thinking. If someone comes to me and says something, some strong opinion about anything in the news, the first thing I'm going to ask is not where do they stand? Where do they stand? Where, where do they think? No, where, did, who's, what kind of thinker is this person? Where, right. wh- what part of the ladder were they on when they came up with this idea? And I'm trying to learn about that before I know whether to trust them or not. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking whether I should kind of lay down my pushback now or get into the golem idea first. I feel like they are related. These are related. So why don't, let's do the, now tell me the, yeah, bring well, me to so, the, the genie versus the golem. Right. So, so, so we can like, you know, simplify, I have four rungs and a lot of, we can simplify it to like high rung thinking, which is like truth first, even if there's a little confirmation bias, truth so ends up winning. though, scientific method, I would say. Yeah, like scientific the, how method. How get to the truth. Yeah. Um, and in the end, it, there is enough ev- there. It, it, with, even if you have some confirmation bias, and if there's really good evidence against your idea, you will change your mind. That's the definition. When you cross below that midpoint, you're a low rung thinker. And now, even if you you you, you think you're a good thinker, you, you'll find evidence and stuff. But deep down, there's nothing that could actually make you say I was wrong about this. Then you're in low you're in low rung thinking land. So I kind of you can kind of say you know there's you simplify it to just two kind of ways of thinking. Now, this is as an individual. All of us kind of go up and down on that ladder. And when I, this is what I talked a little bit about earlier with kind of, we can have collective wisdom and intelligence. We also can have collective stupidity and madness and evil. And those happen, uh, th- th- that to me that is, is that if you, it, that these, th- this individual way of thinking, they have emergent properties. So a bunch, so a group of people together, whether it's your text thread or classroom or a, a, just an individual married couple or a whole political party, they, there's a there's an intellectual culture that uh, takes over, and that intellectual culture can either serve the the purpose of truth ultimately, where it's like cool to disagree, cool to change your mind, saying I don't know makes you sound smart, not stupid, and and disagreement is kind of the culture where it's like you're never gonna no one takes it personally, uh, and down and, and so so I so I call that an idea lab idea lab culture. Uh, intellectual culture and down below you have echo chamber culture right so e- echo chamber culture basically is low rung thinking on a mass scale low rung thinking collectively where the group itself does what the individual low rung thinker does when they say i'm not going to change my mind there's i won't listen to evidence that disagrees the group now punishes socially punishes people who say something that contradicts the sacred belief of the group and it's something and and they're constantly together like sourcing sources sourcing information that confirms their belief just confirm confirm they'll sit around for three hours at a dinner just talking about how right they are the entire dinner and everyone of course agrees because if you don't agree you're an awful person you're not in the group anymore so that's echo chamber culture and when i grew when i thought about it, is that you know these don't just affect each individual what, what kind of the culture you surround yourself with but they have these collective this emergent property so the emergent property of idea lab culture of collective high rung thinking is what i call like a genie and it's this thing i said you know we can, none of us know how to how to discover uh, the subatomic particles or get to Mars uh, alone. But the genies can, right? Genies can. Genies can have wisdom. It's like that. That's like this this super brain when all of our brains connect like neurons with each other, and everyone can disagree, which means everyone can say what they're really thinking. Now you have this thing that's smarter than any human. That's what I call a genie. On the other hand, echo chamber culture is it makes another kind of giant, an emergent property 
of it is uh, this giant, I call a golem, this big kind of dumb giant. And and it, the genie, while it's very wise and intelligent, smarter than any human, the golem is like just mindless and has no, and is, and is, and is a psychopath thinks that, you know, we, you know, you know, kill, kill whoever else. I, if you're not in my in-group, you're an awful person. Those people are bad. We are good. It's just tribalism kind of, it's like tribalism um, as a character. And I call it this golem. And when I see, you know, re, you know, it marches in the street that are chanting awful things. I just, I don't see a bunch of people. I see this tramping like Godzilla, like, um, you know, uh, big golem. Tra- Probably. The okay. So and I thought it was also in the the echo chamber, the sort of breeding ground of the golem. Um, you you mentioned the the quality of enforcement or the tool of enforcement is the taboo, which yeah. strikes me as true. Um, I would say that probably it's not just mobs of people chanting things in the street that are golems. Any mob of people chanting anything in the street, whether we like it or not, is a golem. Like, I think that they're so okay. So, I guess the question I have is while you framed all of these things on a gradient from the best to the worst, or the most admired, the, the, what you the most aspirational to the least, the maybe the most dangerous, I kind of have seen a place for I've seen I, there's utility in zealotry, I think. And there's utility in the golem that I want us to maybe have a quick discussion about. And I want to start with just when we're, when we're talking about the zealotry of ancient knowledge, which feels like very antithetical to um, somebody at that top top rung as a scientist, you know, uh, using the scientific method. You look at something like the dietary laws in the Old Testament, and it's like you should not be eating shellfish or pork or whatnot. And 99.9% of people who follow these faiths just blindly adhere to that. And it's silly and it makes no point. I eat shellfish all the time and pork. I'm totally fine because I live in a world of refrigeration. But that ancient knowledge that went unchallenged and, um, uh, you know, I'd never, most people throughout time were maybe, or in these religions were, were perhaps following, th- there was utility in them following that guidance, even though they weren't thinking about it. And um, so just like right off of the bat, that one's obvious because we understand it. And it's like, oh, probably that's a law because it saved a lot of people's lives, you know, in the in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Um, what other knowledge is in there that is also serving some kind of utility that we just don't understand and has been passed on? And and so in this way, maybe like there, there are ideas that you can follow that... Um, that are saving your life. And and so I see like this, there's just this tension in, yes, we should be interrogating ideas, but I don't know that everything that hasn't been fully interrogated should be discarded. And in fact, um, you know, the high level thing, all this polarization that we're looking at, um, this just increasingly, I mean, 20th century was the most violent century in history, I think, it just in terms of raw numbers of deaths. Um, all of it kind of coincides with the decline of faith in the West, which is like the decline of this inherited knowledge structure. Um, now, people have fought wars for faith, and I understand it's extremely bloody and it's extremely violent, and maybe the only difference is technology. But right, just right there, before we get to the golem, do you maybe see what I'm saying? Did I yeah. misunderstand? What, what is your what is your response? I, I, no, I do see what you're saying, and I, I think um, I think that the 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 so what you're saying is that sometimes there is an idea that is, it's ideal if everyone just would believe it. It would be best for everyone. And there, in, the, in an idea like that, if there's kind of widespread... No, I'm saying the zealotry of faith has perhaps protected us in ways that we don't even understand. And so as we discard these things, we could be in danger in ways that we don't yet understand. I, I think with faith, I think that is, I, I used to, you know, I, like a lot of kind of for, you know, I don't know, people who, who used to be center left, whatever it would say is they, they went through a similar path where um, they, you know, in 20, 2008 and 2006 and 2012 thought, you know, the, the Christian right was the big problem. Christianity, you know, religion was bad. Um, and I think, I, I think like, like me, a lot of us have kind of come around and realized that um, 
that we are a religious species and we will be religious about something. And maybe that the thing that's gone through 2000 years of trial and error and actually has a bunch of incentives to behave well to your fellow human is not the worst thing. And that when yeah, you replace you it, pick one. <laughs> yeah, when you replace it with some political religion that was invented yesterday, um, you know, it has no kind of moral, you know, un under, um, you know, structure underneath it. Um, that's how you get things like the, the Nazis and, you know, S Stalin and just like Maoists, just like mass death. And, you know, yes, religion also causes mass death, but, you know, the kind of American, you know, version of Christianity for all its faults, like, I, I you know, it's, it, there's, there's on the left, 70%, I think of people on the left, just like very similar numbers to the right, consider themselves Christians, like, in 1990 and now it's down to like 35 on the left right while the right has remained the same that gap's gotten filled by something that's pretty nasty so i think you're making a totally good point here um i think that the only issue is that if, if you're relying on like you know you're saying that you know some zealotry is good and, and sure you just you have to get lucky you have to hope that the things people are being zealots about happen to be serving us in some way and so often they don't and at least if you have independent thought, you know, uh, you know, you can, you, you sometimes will lose the benefit of like mindless zealotry towards something that happens to be helpful, but you also cure yourself of all the, you know, I think in, in general, you'd have a net positive. If you just turn people into more humble, independent thinkers, yeah, you're going to lose something. But the problem for me isn't that necessarily that we're losing zealotry of one kind. It's that we're getting zealotry of another kind. Um, and, and, um, um, and, you know, with it's, it's something like uh, shellfish, whatever. And, you, you know, that I still think we can arrive at so much of here's what's actually best using the scientific method. And then people can feel 100 percent about it because of the good for good reasons, because they actually had know it and, and, and they have institutions that can figure this stuff out and they trust those institutions. So we can get to kind of a really, sh you know, um, uh, st st kind of strongly held views about good things the other way. But so I, it's not that I think zealotry is always like a bad thing, like you're saying. It's just that I think that if that's the rule, you're going to have so many bad, worse, so so many more bad tribes doing bad things than you will have good, you know, I think, if you yeah. look at history. I, uh, I agree. I mean, first of all, just I agree that there are all sorts of things in this sort of ancient inherited knowledge that are wrong and counterproductive and, and even dangerous, often dangerous. Um, I just have increasingly this sense that it's Lindy. It's survived for a reason. Um, it was beneficial. And the modern world has untethered me from that to such a degree that I'm a little bit blind right now. And and maybe we're always a little bit blind. Like You can only interrogate so many facts about your world and independent thinkers can only think through so much. Um, these stories in the Bible, for example, they feel like coded in for like super, super wound, bound tight coded bits of information. These stories, like the various parables and whatnot, um, there's a lot in there that uh, we've thrown away. And I think, yeah, if you could rethink through everything for the modern world, you'd make a lot of changes. But until we get there, like, well, I would, I would also something to, to, to rest on, on top of. So, I'd also say that, you know, maybe if I could press a button and, you know, we just kind of go back in time to a time when most people are kind of blindly following the Bible or whatever, would that be better than today? Maybe. Um, but we're, that's not what's happening. Like, there's yep. also just the fact that in the modern world of the internet, and I think you're going to, it was inevitable you're going to see a breakdown of those religious assumptions. Um, yeah, and but I'm you, not hearing, you're right, but I'm not hearing anything from, so let's just call it what it, we're talking about. The left's new faith is this intersectional, like oppression-based, woke ideology, whatever you want to call it, that thing. Um, and then you have on the other side, let's talk about like Islamism or something, like a radical, concert, like super right-wing, patriarchal at its most extreme, which is like 15 to 20% uh of practitioners we're talking like prison state status religion um the kind of like what people think of when i was in college and i used to think about the christian right which was like a completely made up idea in my head i was thinking about radical islam oh, yeah 
Um, really, so, really actual. So like these are the two like I, these are the two faiths that I see at work in the world right now, and uh, I don't want either. And so, what is like your mass defense from that? But some other kind of like well, faith. but, but that's what I'm saying. I don't. I, I look. I, I I just think that the idea that that um, you'll have giant masses of new young people kind of um, blindly believing one of the old ideas that's two thousand years old. I just think that that's unlikely to happen. Maybe there's a big wave of you know n new you know born again whatever. But to me, I just think that for you know for better or worse, I think that those days are not here anymore. And you're going to have more and more people defecting from the old things because the internet is just there to break things down and you're not yeah. in these silos. And therefore, given that fact, I think that we would love to start training a lot of people on independent thought because at least a bunch of independent thinkers are not going to end up chanting for, you know, the death of innocence. Like that's not that in a bunch of independent thinkers just don't do that. It's, it's when everyone hands over their independence to this collective go golem that you have total psychopathy. So, um, yeah, I just think, yeah, I, th I think that at least that's better than than what we're when getting. it comes to the golem. Uh, you do this interesting, you talk, you kind of take the historic, the American historical context of this and you demonstrate how when you have a collective golem, for example, strong nationalism in the 20th century uh, is kind of the infographic that you use. You have like the American patriotic yeah. looking golem and then beneath that golem, you had the red and the blue. Yeah. Um, they were able to get along because they, they had this like higher like level and lower that. So 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 okay so when you think about like tribalism we think of all the tribalism as my team versus yours but actually there's different layers so if you go to if you go to 1950s if people think oh it was a time of relative unity politically you, you elected this moderate eisenhower who wasn't even sure which party he was going to run for i mean the totally different kind of time but actually it's not that we were any less tribal it's that the tribalism was distributed so you had some people whose minds were just fixated on patriotism and xenophobia and you know uh, america versus first hitler and then soviet union then you also then below that you have some people who are um, so worked up about Republican versus Democrat who's going to win the presidency or whatever or, or whatever and and the, and and then below that you had in, within each party just these factions hated each other and they would actually so the the, the down below um, those factions encouraged people to actually they hated the, their own brother and their thing so much that they would go with the the kind of the cousin uh, uh, in the other party over anything besides my brother. So that that was a force of unity up above in the national red versus blue thing. And likewise, you had the um, the national thing was a sense of unity that kind of calmed down the red versus blue thing. So each of these diffuses the other layers, right? And it kind of is healthy in some ways. It's distributed tribalism uh, from the top to high to the low level. And then you see for both two different reasons, the factions, we, you know, we, we, we realign politically. So all those factions kind of change, change. And now it becomes much more two teams. And if you're not on that team, you're not, it's not that you're, we're going to fight within our party. You're out of the party and you're in the other party. And now you have this ideological kind of consolidation. And then we stop having the heart, real serious, scary threat of Soviet union, Hitler and the Soviet union. Like we, we lose our real fear there, which loses our, which takes our tribalism down a notch. And suddenly, and then you have these media stations popping up, Fox News, MSNBC, et cetera. Right. Well, I'll get into broadcast in a second, but it it doesn't... U.S. versus Hitler was highly tribal. And right. But, 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 but it, was, it, was, it was one form and it helped diffuse the national hatred of each other. Right. So there was a utility. Yeah, just, just like if aliens attacked Earth, of course, we'd all I was, I was thinking about Independence Day in, right. in the, exactly. the whole time. It, it, so it, it, in Independence Day, the thing that brings us all together is a new external villain, yes. but it's another other. So there or, is Or the other way around, if you start having um, Republicans fighting about Trump, that's going to make the red versus blue thing calm down a little bit because they're yeah. so mad at each other. And likewise, if you have, you know, Muslims start to fight about, you know, something that's going to calm down the, the tribalism. So we lost that. And in the U.S., it basically all consolidated into this one layer of national red versus national blue. And it's this concentrated tribalism. And that's when things get scary. That's when things, we become really psychotic. So the thing that I'm struggling with is because it, it just seems like what was really beneficial was having a common enemy. And that is still really bad. Like it is still, it seems like hardwired into us to be searching for the enemy period. And uh, obviously an external is 
better, he- seems much healthier than an internal, but an external is still really bad. A little bit, we- but a little bit of patriotism and a little bit of like, we're all Americans is healthy. And, you know, of course, yeah. it, you know, going to its extreme, you have hardcore xenophobia and people hate criming immigrants and stuff. So we don't want to go there, but it's like a little bit right now we have so little of that. You know, is, yeah, it's you, like, there's very little red and blue people from across the aisle hugging each other and be like, hey, we're all Americans. And no one's saying that. That's <laughs> not. And likewise, by the way, like, you know, when Israel Palestine picks up, you know, it's making Muslims who are, you know, in fierce battle with each other, you know, different sects and different political groups. Well, you see this with Hezbollah. They're saying, you know, you're, you're, I love you, brother. You're, you know, the any, you know, the Sunnis don't like each other until there's a war with Israel. But it diffuses it when there's Israel. We don't have that right now in the US. We don't have like this, this Israel. We don't have something. And that's what I'm saying. It's like Al Jazeera. You see that this is used to kind of uh, simmer the national stuff because they can all focus on this other thing. And, 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 uh, uh, Americans don't have that right now. Something that all Americans can say, of course, I prefer any American over this thing. No, no one has that. Yeah. Um, it seems when you are at war, you need a golem to survive. What do you think about that? So, yeah, yeah. this is why we all have the capability to, to do this. We, all of us, including me and you, we have this switch that will make us suddenly just kind of crazy and we'll be thinking, good, kill, kill as many people. I mean, just madness, evil, right? We will, we, 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 we all have it. And it's because we, we evolved in a world where these golems were tramping around our, the land. And if you couldn't, when you needed to form an even bigger golem and defend yourself, you're done. So the people yeah. that didn't have that switch, they're just not around anymore. And so, um, I do think like if, if, if your, if your country is invaded, you know, that's the time when you 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 need to for your own survival. You need to form psychopathic golem yourself, and and or else you're gone. So, yeah, this capacity is the thing. The reason that every person on the planet has this capacity is because every person on this planet has an ancestor who survived because of this capacity. Yes, has many many ancestors that survived. Both, both the golem and the and the, the genie. You need yeah, to, yeah because you cooper- need, in peacetime, oh. cooperation is how you're you became you know you. you, you, you prosperous and you had food and you, you know, you, so, um, it's, but, but what I, what, what's upsetting is, you know, what we, it's like, yes, if literally the U S has invaded, okay, you know, we should all just form a golem and just become psychopaths to try to defend ourselves. But until that time, I do think that that switch is very, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, we, 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 we are very, um, uh, prone to set a switch it because our brain thinks we're still in 50,000 BC and there's this th- there's this group that we don't like on Twitter and it makes us suddenly activate and it's no one's going to kill us right now so right now 90% 99% of the time golems are being activated it's not for because it's it's existential it's because it's just our nature and then what happens is those golems activate each other and it escalates until maybe you do have a civil war or you do have right. something so I one think other that, yeah sorry yeah. Just don't finish your point no no no, no. I was just going to say another funny thing about that online is just how often the golems manifest in the stupidest way possible over the stupidest things imaginable. So it's like, like the entire, like, let's just say like the entire, like, like really almost everything with gender, like the, the gender golems are so crazy and they're go they're straight up golemed up. Like they're golemed up fighting. Like, 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 like the trans swimmer or something like that is what's driving people nuts. And-, and you know you know you're in the presence of of this kind of low rung echo chamber golem psychology when you know if you if you say something, even if it's something that ninety percent of normal people would just say obviously, you get this incredible negative reaction because you've 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 given an existential threat to the goal. So golems, so genies are actually very robust, right? You know, you can bring disagreement and they say great, they thrive off disagreement. Golems are, they're strong, but they're brittle and they're fragile. And they, they, their entire being is glued together by agreement, by 100% zealot tree agreement. And, and so any doubt within the group or outside the group has to be squashed immediately. This is the you know, blasphemy because it can't handle any form of doubt. Uh, the golem melts away, right? The, the switches, the, the psychopath switches go off once there's doubt. So you will see it when you notice a crazy strong reaction to any dissent. You're you're looking at that psychology. The internet itself strikes me as, I mean, certainly structurally, it's built to be a kind of idea lab. It's and yet it seems like it's maybe fallen a lot. It's fallen pretty short in in this respect. What do you think is causing that? I, I think I think there really is a good and bad story here in that, um, you know, like the the people I follow on Twitter. I do because I wrote this book. I follow a lot of zealots on both sides of every issue because I just want to see what they're saying. 
even though it's maddening. Wow, your feed must be very fun now. <laughs> After yeah, I'll, I'll, but 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 that's not the majority. The majority of people I follow are people who I think are extremely well reasoned and 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 you know high wrong thinking. So I I do feel like I'm getting uh, because when I go on Twitter for a few hours, I come out with a bit more nuanced understanding, and I'm a little humbled about something I thought, and I. And I, and I just have a, I just feel like I am it's versus if I live in like, if it's 1980 and I'm just around the same 12 people at work or in my friend group, I'm going to be maybe more in an echo chamber than I am now. So I think the internet really is, um, a place where idea lab culture can spread. Um, the problem is the current first, I feel like we're still in kind of a V1 of social media. Maybe we're in V2 of social media algorithms. And I think maybe in 20, 30 years, we'll look back and say, oh my God, those algorithms were just totally um, hardwired to misery engines and, 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 and to stoke the switches, to stoke lower yeah. culture, to bring people down. And so you'll see there'll be one completely wrong, infuriatingly worded, like tweet that is misleading, intentionally misleading in propaganda. Right. And on Twitter right now, not only is that tweet do really well amongst the people who it's t- targeted for, you see, you know, 7,000 retweets and you're like, Oh my God, this is so annoying. But also it's being passed around to all the people who hate that side and it's making them really angry and it's making it and it's making it feel like there's no reason over there. And so I, I think that right now you do have um, the, the, these uh, the, the, the escalating thing that can happen with tribalism and it goes here and then they said this and that we hate them more and we hate them more. And now they're showing these pictures of these dead kids and this one and before you know it, like there's just kind of mania going on that the Internet is really good at producing that. And that's that's the social media side. I mean, then there's also the the, the, the way tribal media has. That, that's this, a sudden, all the things, but. let's see so you talked in the in the book you talk about uh the difference between broadcast and narrow cast and throughout the 20th century we had more of a broadcast model where um you had a handful of media giants speaking to everybody and that forced people more to the center and uh it seemed like a much more ascended intellectual model even though it's missing a lot of details um the narrow cast model, which begins, I don't know where you would say it begins, but you, you cited uh, in 1996 was um, both Fox and MSNBC were formed. And certainly by the internet now, we're living in a new media world, which is entirely narrow cast. And by that, we mean um, smaller entities speaking to very niche audiences, giving them basically exactly what they want to hear. Um, it seems like it's framed in such a way as, as broadcast would be sort of... Um, better in some in some way uh and maybe in most ways than than narrow casting which feeds the 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 golem like demons and yet i would just quickly introduce this idea that what we're seeing right now while infuriating on the topic of israel and gaza like we it seems like you know we can't come to agreement on something in earlier days so uh the 20th century was a time of war like big nationalistic war constantly and in, in america like I, I thought about um well iraq was the most recent example of this but before that i think the much worse example the reason that we all hate ourselves now in america i think is vietnam which was a really horrifying war and my dad's a vietnam vet and it's very complicated and i think the only way vietnam could happen was the broadcast model. I think yeah. in a narrow cast world, I don't know that Vietnam would have happened. I think that's a really good point. I think that there's there's such a clean, clear story about the negatives of transitioning from broadcast to narrow cast. And I I think that Vietnam is a perfect example of the upsides of narrow cast, mm-hmm. upsides of social media. I think that Vietnam, the Americans would have figured out that that was a stupid war and that, that it was, you know, whatever in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And it took... A de- over a decade instead. Um, and so I, I do think that there's something, I think that, you know, there's just a lot more real info out there. And there's uh, the, 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 you know, t- again, I tr- Twitter has a lot more info than the, the mainstream media. Um, you know, you, 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 you're going to really, you want, you want to see what's going on now and what everyone thinks about it. And like, um, it happens quickly on Twitter and all the, the sides form and they everything. Shift and, yeah. yeah. All there. I just had a disagreement with uh, Noah Smith about this. He said, he kind of denied that he was on Twitter during the weekend terrorist attacks uh, on Israel and that he was getting all this news from the New York Times when I was like, that's just, I don't believe you. No. Everything I learned, I would not have known what was going on in Israel were it not for my live feed of carnage, which is perhaps not healthy, but I certainly think like I am immune to the 
to the I was immune to the coverage that the New York Times was giving on Saturday yeah. night. A lot um, of us were. And, and that was because I was looking at it, right? Like I was actually seeing the people kidnapped. I was actually seeing the death. Like it's, it's, it's not just seeing it. It's like on Twitter, because again, it depends who you follow, but I follow a wide variety. So on Twitter, I go on and a couple hours later, I've seen all the pictures. I've seen the claims that the pictures are not real. I've right. seen, the, I've seen the, the people refute those claims. The community I, notes, the notes I've on seen, the notes. I've seen 10 different takes on history. I've seen 10 different takes on comparing, you know, the rising anti-Semitism to another time. Right? I've seen all these, you know, comparing Israel-Palestine to Liberia and other people comparing it to uh, Algeria and other people comparing it to the U.S., you know, the slaves. And, and I also, in my head, I have a little meter of where I think... Uh, how high rung each of those thinkers is from my own experience in the past. So each time I'm also kind of taking certain things with different grains of salt. And two hours later, I have such a rich, nuanced, I feel like, picture of what's going on. Um, you know, and 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 if I go to the New York Times, even if they were completely the most unbiased, just trying to say the truth, it's just one point of view and it's a couple journalists trying to do it. Um, and then, of course, you have the issue that the, that the mainstream media does PR for whatever side that they want to do PR for in addition to doing the news. So- right. That is a massive upgrade over now. Granted, the New York Times today is partially less trustworthy because of the narrow cast model, where at least CBS, NBC, and, and and ABC in the '60s, I think, would be more trustworthy maybe than the New York Times today. Um, but and definitely more trustworthy than MSNBC, Fox News today, I think, uh, for a typical issue. But on the other hand, uh, that's all you got. So it's like you know. So so for understanding an issue like something that's happening right now, I'll take today over that. But there's a huge, huge other story about the downside here, about how it became a model where it used to be the business model was be accurate and seem totally neutral. Because if you start to seem biased, you're going to lose half the country. You're going to become a laughing stock if you seem inaccurate. If you get proven, if NBC seems to be wrong more than the other two, you're done. Then in 90, right, right mid 90s, you start to have these it, Fox News, I think, kind of pioneered it. And it was like, wait a second, the, the country's gotten really tribal. We can have a whole other business model and we throw accuracy and neutrality out the window, not totally, you know, but we throw it largely out the window and instead tell one tribe what they really want to hear. And it's just a completely different business model. And then suddenly a hundred copycats come on because it's a brilliant business model today and it makes a ton of money. And the, and you have social media algorithms, and I think that the, the, this is very, um, it stokes tribalism in a very hardcore way. Yeah, I would say the broadcast... Monopoly was captured ideologically. Like Fox, when it comes out, every they're they're saying we're going to give you the real truth because you you know you've been lied to. The reason the message resonated was because people knew that they were not getting the entire truth. They were getting a very biased version of that. Like people are always going to be imperfect. When I, I so the unbiased, right? Like I am very biased. Everything that we write at Pirate Wires is biased. It's biased. It's biased by our perspective. And I try and own that and say, this is who we are. This is how I see things. This is what I want to happen. Like you take everything, when, what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Um, I think that the narrow cast thing feels, it's weird, right? It's both. It feels healthier, but then also what you were just describing on Twitter, having to go onto Twitter for a couple hours and download every crazy opinion and history, that's exhausting. And um, I don't like, we're very online creatures. We're both writers. Like we're online. I don't know how the average person is going to make it <laughs> in this information. Well, environment. One thing you can start to do is you can find proxies. You can say, you know, this person I've now seen five or six times seem to have a nuanced view, or maybe these two people. So I'm just going to listen to this person's podcast and that's how I want to get it. And, 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 you know, I, I vetted that, that they're a high wrong thinker. They can go do all that looking what's going on in Twitter and they can come back and I'll at least trust them. Of course, a lot of people end up trusting a hardcore zealot who agrees with them instead. But this is uh, J Oliver, John Oliver. Is this for people? I Joe know. Rogan, Joe Rogan. Is this for people? Like, yeah, these are the, and I, I listen, I, I am not an Oliver guy. I like Joe Rogan, but th both of them are very clearly speaking. Joe, Joe is more honest about it. Maybe that he's like, yeah. this is you know, my perspective or whatever. John Oliver is doing the classic sort of, John Stewart thing, who I also used to love, who was like, I'm just a comedian, but it's like, no, you're, you're a cult leader. And I, that's I was the in the cult, so I loved it. I was in the cult too. I was in that John Stewart cult. I think that, that Joe Rogan will 
if he has a viewpoint, he'll say it and piss off his base. He'll piss off, you know, or he'll yeah. piss off the center right hardcore and make them really angry by defending, you know, Bernie Sanders or something. I don't see that from John Oliver. I don't think he has the willingness. I don't think he's, I, I don't think it's necessarily his particular, I don't think that the, HBO or whatever. He's. I don't think he's even allowed to. We did ever- at least see it briefly from. Uh, t- to go back to our original cult, John Stewart during COVID, I feel like was one of the main reasons. We would have happened eventually. It was just so stupid. But when we had this sort of intellectual embargo on the lab leak, and we couldn't talk about the virus perhaps coming from the COVID factory, Stewart was the one who was like, "No," uh, and I was saying, "You know what? Maybe this guy." This but I was so excited for him to come back and just be like. A voice of reason and he comes back and he starts parading robin d'angelo's ideas around i was like yeah. bro like yeah. really? i was so disappointed i was like yeah. so much- be cooler than that yeah like he, really? I, I really just, you, i thought he was about to shake the world and then it was just like I no know. you're just like an I'm older so version of so other people who are saying dumb things like you it's he's not the john stewart i was like oh knew. he still doesn't want to piss off like woke people like all the other i'm just like this is a small group of people that most no one agrees with, and you're going to be another one of these big voices that just can't disagree with them. Um, I, I want to maybe wrap it up with a, an idea that so we have these frameworks for thinking about um, for thinking about thinking, you know, thinking about navigating our uh, this this information ecosystem that we live inside of. Um, how now facing, I mean, a series like. The terrorist attacks that I saw were like unlike anything I've ever seen or even met. It was horrible. Um, and we're just very clearly entering now a period of total war because, I mean, it's like real crazy violence is what we're approaching. And with that's going to come insane tribalism. It's going to become, I think, very hard to function online as I don't want to call myself reasonable because I'm often not reasonable, but I'm more reasonable than what I'm seeing online right yeah. now. And how do you advise navigating this right now? You know, you've studied this for years. You've got this history book and this kind of the self help book. Like, what do we do? How do we learn about the world right now in a world that is so fraught with uh, misinformation and just emotion? I just think to be aware of what we're seeing. We see golems forming to at least see it for what it is. Understand that this isn't like. These people are evil, but that there's a psychology, you know, psychological switch in our heads that has been switched, and to to just see, you know, see propaganda for what it is, to to know that the people you're going to try need to convince are going to have um, a tendency to be really tribal, to kind of uh, be manipulated by a lot of the, the propaganda, and so if if we just start there and we just kind of like understand this is what humans have done throughout history. We're doing a lot of it. You can see people doing it now. This is how it works. This is how propaganda works. This is how tribalism works. I think that at least prepares us better to A, avoid falling into the pitfalls ourselves and B, like figure out, you know, just, I just try, you know, to retweet the people that are being high rock, regardless of whether they agree with you or not, like to try to add, you know, if we're all on a boat and uh, there's, you know, or, Steering on one side points us towards this, and there's a fork in the river. And one side we're just going to just kind of utter destruction way down, you know, down the road. And the other side we can get out of this and go to like a much happier world. What side of the boat are you paddling? You know, and it's like, you know, just if, if, if just if that's the first thing, like put your own mask that on before helping us. Way others. Western man meme with the dark castle and the and the night. It, it, yeah, exactly. I just, thought about that all throughout your opening of this book. Right. It's it's like just just first just paddle on the right side yourself. Just try to not, to simmer those things and to uh and to call out and be brave. Some courage, you know. Like so many people know what the right things to say and they don't want to tweet it. They don't want to say it out loud because they just why why would you want to? But you know that that means you're taking your paddle out of the water and you know put put your paddle in the water and and steer in the right side and then you can maybe try to maybe try to convince others to do the same. Because when you're not paddling, you know it's like you're still being paddled. People are paddling. Oh, yeah. And so many people right now, just in a time like this, think, I, I'm not going to get involved. I don't want to deal with the, the repercussions of this. And it's like, okay, great. But you're allowing like the boat to go in a certain direction. You're not, you know, and if, if, if there's just a kind of a lack of courage Um, and, you know, so courage can be contagious when you get out there and start saying something, you know, other people will too. Um, So I think, I think that was part of what got us into so much trouble Um, in the last few years with, you know, I think I think with woke stuff and with MAGA stuff, like I think you have just a lack of courage. You're people that think this is madness and no one's saying it. And so just to not to learn from that and not do it again. Amazing. 
Um, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, you guys should definitely check out Tim's book again. It is What's Our Problem? Self-help, uh, a self-help book for societies. That's What's Our Problem. And Tim, what is your handle on Twitter? Is it just Tim Urban? Wait, but why? Wait, but why? That's what it yeah. was. Uh, yeah, check out Wait, But Why. Um, this uh, This was great. Thanks again. Thanks, Mike.